Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast, the first and longest running female hosted hunting podcast. She's fine tuned her bow and sighted in her rifle. She has deer on the brain and is ready to go. But first, she's helping you navigate your trip of a lifetime. And now, here's your hostess, Carrie Zilka. Welcome to the Hunt Fish Travel Podcast. I am your hostess, Carrie Zilka, and I am super excited to be back after. Kind of a summer off, took a little bit of time. Um, we've got a big new project coming up, which I will announce here very shortly. But meanwhile, I have I took the chance. So what was it? Two weeks ago, I went salmon fishing. I caught nothing. They were jumping everywhere. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? So I took it to Facebook, and I said, I need some experts. And Corey Yarmuth said, hey, I happen to know some stuff about some salmon. I'm like, you know, I'm pretty sure I've seen a whole lot of posts from you about salmon. So, Corey, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Carrie. Thank you very much. I'm hoping you can teach a gal like me how to successfully do some salmon fishing via podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Anything's possible. As long as you can teach me how to bow hunt like you do. I'm pretty sure I could do that. <laughs> So, like I said, like, so I was out, so here in Wisconsin, the Milwaukee area, Port Washington area, obviously living on Lake Michigan, we have the fall salmon run. And why don't you explain to oh, the yes. listeners a little bit about spring versus fall salmon runs? <clears throat> well, with the fall salmon run, what you're getting is you're getting the the three-year-old fish coming in to complete their life cycle. Uh, a lot of people call them the four-year-olds, but they're in theory three years old and they're coming in to where they were released um, or where they were hatched. Most of the time in the Wisconsin and Illinois area, it's where they were released because the reproduction is not uh, as high as it is over on the Michigan side. So they have it ingrained into their system where they were released and they come in to basically spawn and die. And this happens in the fall. It, basically, a few factors that affect it are the daylight time, water temperatures. Um, it usually starts around Labor Day and goes all the way through until uh, end of October, November. Uh, you'll get some kings left over. And they're coming in to... to lay their eggs um, or fertilize if it be a male and then die. So we're chasing these fall fish because it's a great opportunity to get them in a congregated area to catch them casting with crankbaits, um, catching them on spawn under a float, catching them on spoons. It's just a, it, catching them on hook and line versus trolling is a, it is a lot more fun and much more of a challenge. Way more fun, in my opinion. Having done both, taking the charter, and I really, really, well, I like casting, you know. I don't know, you can troll yeah. around, and that's fun, too, but it can get a little boring where, at least with the casting, you're constantly moving, you're constantly doing stuff. Correct. You're constantly moving, and then when you have one of these fall kings hit, uh, it's like a freight train, and I've had them almost rip the rod right out of my hand, and the, there's just something about that adrenaline rush of having a a 20 plus pound fish strike your lure and just take off like a lack of better expression, a bat out of hell. Yeah. So, say I had never gone salmon fishing before, and I said, Corey, I am going down to the harbor. I have no idea what I'm doing. What would you be? Su what would you suggest as the setup I should use as a as a newbie salmon fisherman? Well, one one of the great things about the fall salmon run is anybody can do it. Uh, it doesn't take necessarily specialized equipment. Uh, most I know guys that will use their own their best equipment. Uh, personally. If I'm fishing from shore, I like to use a spinning rod. I like a longer spinning rod, upwards of 10 feet. Um, most of my average is 8 foot 6 uh, to to 
nine six. And the reason I like to use a longer spinning rod is I want to get the longest cast that I can with the bait that I'm using. I'm trying to get that bait out there as far as possible because these false fish, they're not feeding. They are striking purely out of aggression, is purely instinctual strikes. That's why uh, I prefer personally to use crankbaits because especially with something that has a big wobble to it, something with a rattle. Uh, and so I prefer to run, like I said, an eight foot six to a 10 foot rod spinning rod, which the spinning reel gives me a, a much smoother, further cast, uh, usually a 4,000 series spinning reel. So it's got a bigger spool on it. Uh, the bigger spool allows me longer cast, but it also allows me more line when those fish run. Um, I typically will run 15-pound, 10- or 15-pound braid, and will sometimes put a fluorocarbon leader on it because the, the fish can be line shy uh, during the day. Uh, even though they're striking out of aggression, you know, they still can see that line and and will shy away rather than be more aggressive. So the, as far as rod and reel, that's what I prefer to use. Now, it's not gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, you, whatever you feel comfortable with, if you've got a seven-foot medium, medium heavy action rod sitting in the corner with, you know, spooled up with 10-pound mono, you can easily go out and fish the shore for kings, fish from a boat, you know, casting for the kings. So that's why I like to, to not pigeonhole people. You know, you'll see a lot of people with a wide variety of gear. So I like to see people get out there and do it and enjoy it and try to tell people that they don't need specialized equipment to necessarily go out and do this, if they, especially if they, they have it sitting around the house. So why, what, okay, so circling back to the whole, they're striking out of aggression. Is that, is it because it's similar to like, like in the spring, I always think about the bass, like the smallmouth bass on their nests. You know, the whole point is to agitate them so that they want to pick up the yes. lure. Is it that same kind of a thing where you're just trying to drive them exactly nuts because they're protecting? Yep. Yeah, basically, what what you're doing is it's very similar to like when uh, a deer goes in the rut and they stop feeding, they stop eating. Uh, they got one thing on their mind, and that's to procreate. And those fish, they they stop eating, they stop feeding. They're in there. It's all instinctual. And what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to irritate that fish, and that's why, like I mentioned. I like to use crankbaits because a crankbait has a really good wobble to it. And a lot of times it'll have a good rattle in it. And I like to reel it very slow, I mean, painfully slow, to where you don't think you're reeling fast enough. And if you think you're not reeling fast enough, then you need to slow it down even more. And the, re the reason being is that bait is wobbling in the water and given the conditions of Lake Michigan over the past 15, 20 years with it becoming very clean, if you can imagine a fish's eyesight is very, very good. And then when you have that clean water, it increases their ability to see a bait from a long distance away. So with a crankbait, the longer that bait is in front of that fish, the more agitated that fish is going to get and want to strike that bait. The same goes for uh, salmon fishing when you're up in Alaska or out in the East Coast, or excuse me, West Coast, where they're running flatfish baits in the current. Those baits are just sitting there. They're not going forward or backwards. They're just sitting there wobbling in the current. It's That bait is staying right in front of that fish long enough to, for that fish to just get annoyed enough to strike that bait. Hmm. 
uh, <clears throat> it's another misnomer people have uh, in the fall with the fishing with spawn. Uh, the, the the salmon eggs, people think they're eating those eggs, and you know for food, and what they're actually doing is trying to proliferate their eggs. So if they see eggs floating, the first instinct they have is to crush them and destroy them. So when you I watch a lot of fishermen who will be fishing with spawn under a float and they'll think they're fishing for pike and they'll see that float go down and they want to give that to the fish for a little bit. And all of a sudden their float will pop back up and there's no fish there. Well, those fish are actually just coming up to that bait, smashing it, crushing it, and then letting it go. And that's one of the things I teach when people have that float go down or if that float just decides to lay on its side, is you grab and you set that hook as, as quickly as possible. Because if you wait, that fish will spit that right out. Because, again, they're not feeding. They're just either striking baits out of aggression or they're hitting spawn to proliferate their species. That is very interesting. I had no idea. I thought they were eating it like, I don't know. But I guess why would they eat their own young? That would be weird. But Well, it, it, I mean, some do eat their own young, but yeah. the, 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 the salmon, they're, they're, just doing it to to get rid of other competition and that a lot of guys early in the season will 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 throw spoons um i like i said my preference is crankbaits and that's just because they have the action the noise um the color and all of those will play uh, a role in whether you're successful or not uh, as far as, you know, more wobble versus less wob- wobble, more noise versus less noise. And a lot of guys <clears throat> out there, there, there's a million schools of thought. So every time I talk to people about fishing for the fall Kings, I tell them, I said, you need to do what's, works for you. A lot of guys will swear up and down about using glow. Personally, I don't use glow. I have a bunch of them in my box, but I prefer not to use them because with the surrounding lights of the harbors and the color of the bait, it has enough movement and action that it can be seen from quite a distance by these fish. And given how their eyesight is and how keen their eyesight is, a lot of times a glow bait, if you initially glow it, it glows so bright that they shy away from it because it's like if you walked into a room that was pitch black and then turn the light on immediately. All you see is white. And the the first thing you want to do is close your eyes or, or, or turn away. Now I've seen fish do this, bringing a glow bait through the water where they will scatter. And I have talked to, you know, several people and my, including myself while I've been fishing, seen it where a bait that has just been flashed with a to make it glow typically won't get hit as often as a bait that's been glowing already for five six or ten casts really now there are people that would argue that point i do know people that feel that the first flash is the most important but in my experience, uh, and I've been fishing for you know the Fall Kings for quite a while, and I've just found that if I stick with brighter chartreuse, white, 
um, or it, depending on the water clarity, go to a darker color that has a contrast to the clearer water. I found that to be more productive than the guys casting glow lures on the left of me or the right of me. I won't be throwing a glow lure and I will have three or four fish already in the net and they'll want to know what I'm doing differently. And I will explain to them and once they you change over to a different bait or something that's got a little bit more action to it, it completely changes uh, the way they look at it. That's interesting. I know a lot of people, they always have like their go-to ones because that's what they're catching fish on. And I know, you know, fishing Port Washington compared to Racine Harbor or whatever the case may be, or one of the harbors in Illinois. Do you think that, I guess it's just a crapshoot on whatever the fish is, whatever's annoying them the most. That <clears throat> I mean, yeah. Like... Well, when it comes down to it, 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 it depends on uh, a lot of water clarity. It will depend on depth. Uh, if I'm fishing in areas like Waukegan, where I'm fishing a little bit shallower water, I'll be throwing something like a uh, a J13 with pop Arapala. So I'll throw a J13 Rapala, which does not dive as deep, but it has a really big wobble. Uh, up in Milwaukee, if I'm fishing inside the sailboat harbor, I'll throw a Reef Runner 700. If I'm fishing outside in towards the gaps, I'll do a Reef Runner 800. Now, the difference between those two is the Reef Runner 700 only dives down to about 10 feet, where the 800, I can get that down to 20 feet with a uh, a long cast. So basically all I'm trying to do is to get that bait to where the fish are. If the fish are up high, even if I'm in 20 feet of water, I want that bait to be up high because you'll see them moving around and those fish move in pots. Um, they're not okay. individuals. So if you're ever on the shore and you're catch, you know, casting, and you happen to see somebody down the way hook up. Be ready. Don't don't waste your time because there is a good chance that a pot of fish is moving through, and you could, you know, if you get your bait out there and intercept that pot of fish, because you'll see it if you get out in a boat and you're you're bumping around in the harbor with uh, a good side imaging or dominant imaging product, you'll see those schools of fish moving around. And you'll actually can see it with them jumping. You'll see them all, just a whole lot of activity in like a half an hour's time, and then all of a sudden you won't see any activity. And that pot of fish has moved through. Do you... So going back to what depth, like there are some days where you're out there and the surface is just glass. And then there are other days where they're jumping and they're spitting and everything like constantly. Would that, would it be a fair assumption that if there's not a lot of surface action going on that you should be diving deeper and fishing deeper? Where should you be fishing shallower if you see a lot of movement on the, towards the surface? Typically, rule of thumb, that's what I like to do. Um, I like to, you know, it if there I do have a lot of surface activity, I will keep my bait a little bit higher in the water column. Uh, if I don't have a lot of activity, I will be looking for a little bit deeper water, uh, whether I'm fishing from shore or if I'm in the boat casting, I'll, I'll look for the deeper water. But... Again, it's mostly, in my opinion, it's it's those fish moving through in different pods and finding, you know, the act. And when I say active fish, again, they're not feeding, but you're looking for the active fish. They're actively moving. They're act, they're actually, you know, not lethargic. They're just kind of sitting. You'll have them just sitting there doing nothing versus swimming around and and when you've got those active fish up on the surface 
you know, bringing your baits up will definitely help. That's interesting. So everything I pretty much thought I knew, I was wrong. So <laughs> now I'm no, excited and, to get back out there. <laughs> and again, like I said, I I talk about I I do several seminars about you know shore fishing and for the fall kings. And I, the first thing I always tell people up front, I said I'm going to tell you what. I know what I experience, what I do, what I've learned. This does not mean it's gospel. Yeah. You might talk to another fisherman and have something completely different than or disagree with what I say. I just know what has worked for me in the past, what I've learned, what I've paid attention to. You know, it's little details uh, that really can make a difference. So, Details as small as uh, changing your split rings on your baits to obviously keeping sharp hooks to whether or not you use a ball bearing versus a uh, standard snap on your line between your bait and your um, your line. Just small things can make a difference. One of the biggest things I I talk about is I hear a lot of people talk about losing fish all the time on crankbaits. And you're going to lose fish. That's the the nature of the beast. But one of the little tips that I've always talked to about people is a lot of times these fish are striking these, these crankbaits really hard. They're getting them from the side and they're getting that front treble hook on a crankbait into their hard jaw. Well, if you add a second split ring onto that front hook, now you have two split rings and then the hook. That hook actually has a lot more freedom of movement. And these fish will use every advantage they can to basically throw your bait. And they can actually use a larger minnow style crankbait like the Rapala J13s as leverage. They they turn their head and they can actually use that bait and pop that hook out. And if you've got a second split ring on that front, it'll actually reduce the amount of leverage that a fish can get on you. And you'll have more catch ratios versus hookup ratios. And so little small things like that, uh, especially changing out hooks, I can't stress that enough. You know, you're, you can use regular bass crankbaits, but you're definitely going to want to change out the hooks. I preach that up and down. You know, I'm personally, everything I change out to is a Gamakatsu, either a 2X hook, which is the extra strong hook, because these fish will straighten hooks out in a heartbeat. You know, I was going to ask you about that because I've heard, well, actually, I've read quite a few articles where they're like, if you change it from a treble to a single hook, you probably won't lose as many fish. And um, to use like super, super, super sharp hooks because their mouths are so tough. Yes. And their mouths are very tough because what's happening is they're going through a change. Their body's changing. They're not eating. So... Just like uh, uh, a human, if you don't eat, your body starts feeding off of itself. And that's what happens to these fish. They, their gums start receding. And instead of having uh, a meaty mouth, it turns into almost pure bone. So you're needing to really get those hooks in there. And I don't want to get into a single hook versus treble hook debate because yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's, that's a losing battle because one person will have their opinion and another person will have their opinion. Yeah. Um, but it is, it does hold a lot of validity when you talk about leverage that a fish can have. Um, but super sharp is, is key. That's why, like I said, I use the Kamikatsu's, uh, they have an extremely sharp hook. They're stout. 
I can get away with a, a little bit larger of a hook without affecting the action of the bait. Mm-hmm. You, you can go too big and affect the action of the bait, and that's the last thing you want to do. You want that bait to have the best wobble it can. Does So what about the noise factor? I know you said use crankbaits and, you know, noisy things. Is it the noise that agitates them as well, or is it strictly, yes. for the most part, is it sight? Uh, I personally have uh, am a strong believer in both. Um, the noise will, if it's in the in there long enough in the strike zone, it affects their lateral line and will annoy them to the point where they'll strike. And one of the things I like to do, and uh, I've taken Rapala J13s. And because of the fact that those are a balsa bait, they obviously do not have a rattle. Well, I'll actually drill them out and add glass worm rattles to them. Now, it's not a rattle like a rattle trap has or like, you know, some of your hollow plastic baits that do have quite a few BBs in them. But it is a high pitch rattle. And personally, I feel that that high pitch rattle has a little bit more effect on them than just the thumping type of rattle. Really? But that's just, I've done it for years and have found that adding that high pitch glass rattle, I could be throwing the same J13 Rapala next to somebody who's throwing the exact same color and I'm hooking up and they're not. And whether or not that is pure science or pure luck, I'm just going on the fact that I have that confidence in that bait. And I feel that that's what is helping me is that little change, adding the rattles, maybe adding that extra split ring. Cause I get a little bit more rattle out of the hook because it does make a little bit more noise with that extra split ring. So a little bit of everything tends to lean in my favor. If if I can get my an advantage over other anglers to hook up more often, I'm going to take it. Sure. Do you have a favorite color that you have found consistently produces over other colors? Um. It depends on where I'm at, uh, but typically chartreuse and white, pearl white, and then a purple and chartreuse. So those three colors have I found the best. Um, and every bait comes in just about all those colors. Um, my biggest king to date casting came on a white reef runner 800. Um, but then I've caught numerous Kings on the J 13 Rapala in chartreuse and white. And then given the light conditions, if it's darker out, I go and brighter water or clearer water, something with a dark profile, the purple and chartreuse, um, or I believe Reef Runner calls it Hot Tiger, or um, also the Bandit Walleye Bandits. Uh, I like to throw the Bandit crankbaits, um, the Walleye Deeps, in the white, or chartreuse and black. And chartreuse, for anybody who's not familiar with the color, is that greenish, yellow, kind of pukey looking color. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's that obnoxious yes. <laughs> yellow. <laughs> Which, I'm going to be honest, if somebody walked by when they were wearing pukey, yellowish, green, and purple, I would probably strike out too. Just saying. Just <laughs> being honest here. <laughs> That's interesting. So, and I've heard of like a lot of people say pink and white or whatever, but I guess if they're real, you know, just vision sensitive, the more obnoxious colors 
probably yes. for annoying them. That's- so, something that stands out a little bit more. Um, that's why, you know, a lot of people will say the glow works real well because it does stand out. But I have seen on nights where I've had uh, a bright sky, you know, full moon or, you know, a, a good moon out. And I've been able to see the chartreuse and white bait, you know, come 10 feet from me, 15 feet from me. I can see it coming in. So if I can see it in the dark, I know a fish can see it. So essentially in the fall, for the most part, if you're buying live bait, night crawlers and stuff, and you think you're going to go salmon fishing, you're probably wasting your money. Yes. Yes. You're you're looking at throwing um, crankbaits, spoons, flatfish style baits, and or using spawn, uh, you know, big gobs of spawn. Talk to me a little bit just briefly about um, when you go salmon fishing, but then you end up catching trout. Why would that be? Well, the the trout are in there because they're actually feeding on the the eggs. Um, The brown trout are in there feeding on the salmon eggs. They're also coming into spawn as well. So you get the salmon coming in, and then you get the brown trout, to feed on those eggs and then you get the steelhead to feed on the brown trout eggs and the steelhead and the brown trout they don't have the life cycle like a salmon does they they come in they'll spawn and then they'll, they'll then leave the harbor um or some of them will actually be resident fish and stay in the harbor but they don't come in spawn and die whereas the salmon uh, the, the the Chinooks and the Cohos will come in, spawn, and then die. So they're actually f- actively feeding. And they are in those areas where those salmon are because, you know, they're feeding on their on their eggs. Yeah. I know, because a lot of times people will catch brown trout or whatever the case may be. Oh, yeah. Especially in, like, McKinley Marina. Yes, yes. Well, cool. Well, thank you very, very much for the information. Why don't you tell the listeners no a little bit what you're doing out there in the in the outdoor industry? You can also just Google me. Uh, that's C O R Y, and the last name is Y A R M U T H, and that'll bring you to quite a few different uh, links to see some of my articles, photos. Um, and you can, like I said, my website at legend-outdoors.com. You can, my has my email. You can get in touch with me if you got any other questions on on anything, on, from salmon fishing to walleye fishing to bass fishing. I, if it swims, I'll I'll fish for it. <laughs> Excellent. And that'll do it. Thanks so much for listening. Don't forget to find the show on iTunes. Just search for Hunt Fish Travel Podcast and hit the subscribe button. You can also follow me on social media. You can find Hunt Fish Travel on Facebook, or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Carrie Zilka, C-A-R-R-I-E-Z-Y-L-K-A. C-A-R-R-I-E-Z-Y-L-K-A.